we don't know where the people are. You used to have a lot more than this, but it's okay. I preach in some churches that got one or two thousand. I preach in some that got twelve. <laughs> it don't make any difference to me. Thank you for coming. The paper I handed you, I'm going to explain it to you in just a moment. And uh, we're going on a quest for the wisdom of God. You can look at the top of your page. It says the word quest means a search or pursuit made in order to find or obtain something. So we're going on a quest for the wisdom of God. This course will last. This is college level course. That paper you have is actually to take home with you today. And I'll explain to you what you need to do. Uh, there's some people coming in, so I'm going to wait a minute for them and let them come. Uh, would you hand these out, please? One people come in, I appreciate it. <clears throat> this, uh, when you tell people there are college level classes, people get frightened and they won't come. Friend, I can't do it. Yes, you can do it. Because we're studying the Bible, not a history book, but it is a history book. <laughs> and we're not studying psychology, but this book has lots of psychology in it, but it's godly. And uh, so this book has everything you need. And the difference is I'm going to help you understand what it means and explain some of the words to you that usually we just read and bypass because we don't know what they mean, so we don't even check them out. And for that reason, we lose a lot of the content of what the Word is saying. But we're going to take a walk also with wisdom in this course. Now, I want you to listen to these words. You could change and your life will never be the same or not, depending on whether you do the work or not. See, I know people that went through the same college I went to, and they cheated, and they got the same degree I did, but you know the difference? They didn't have the stuff. They didn't learn it. So when they got there, they came empty because they didn't do their homework. I do my homework all the time. And uh, I stay with what I'm doing for the Lord for many years now. And it's paying off. And God is rewarding me and helping me and sustaining me. And I'm not rich, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I've got the Holy Spirit in me. And He is. He knows everything. <laughs> so let's pray and then we're going to get started. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the ones that are here. Lord, may their desire for wisdom be fulfilled may they be strengthened and encouraged and helped in jesus name amen now first of all <clears throat> look at the paper i gave you uh, lesson one walking with the wise is what i'm going to be teaching today and that's from proverbs 13 20 and if you would turn there in your bible and the first one that gets it can read proverbs 13 20 If you walk with the wise, you became you become wise. If you walk with a fool, you, you, you become a fool. So, you know, you need to choose who you're walking with, who your companions are, who your relationships are uh, hooking you up to, because evil communications corrupt good manners. That means lifestyle. So, in lesson one, oh, here, Leon. Oh, she got it. Okay, I'm sorry. On the little outline you have, it says, Lesson 1, Walking with the Wise. Jess, you read it. Proverbs 13, 20. Yeah, that'd be good. See, I don't have to know anything about you. I can just look at the people you hang out with and tell, tell something about you. <laughs> it's true. I don't have to judge you. We know you by your fruits anyway. And in the Bible, that means your lifestyle. Not by what you say, but what you do. And you know what you can do? Only what you are. You can't do something that you're not. 
But you, what you are doing is what you are. And who you choose for friends speaks volumes about your character. Okay? Who you choose to be your personal friend speaks volumes about your character. It tells me your character traits. If you like to hang out with drunks, you probably drink. You know who goes to the bar? People who drink. I don't go down there. Do you go down there? I used to go down there and stay in there all night. But I don't go there anymore. Why? Because that's not a part of my lifestyle. If you hang out with a drunk, will you become a drunk? Well, evil communication corrupt good manners. That means your relationships with people that are not serving God will corrupt you. Why doesn't it work the other way? Because you already have a tendency to lean that way or you wouldn't be with them. When you get the wisdom of God in you, it changes your life. See, these are not academic truths. They're redemptive truths. These truths change your life. What is truth? Jesus said, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. So, this is the only ultimate truth in the earth is found in the Bible. The rest of the stuff is conjecture and stuff people that made up and they got their own doctrines and even people that go to church, uh, good churches, some of them, they have evil communications. They have friendships with people who are evil. And that lets us know they have a tendency to lean to whatever those people do. So I have a tendency to get away from those people. I'm only hanging out with people, and I'm looking for people who know God better than I do to hang out with. I don't hang out with some dummy that's out in the world sniffing, shooting, drinking, smoking, and all that kind of, what's he going to teach me? I don't have no time for people like that. Time is too valuable. Your life is made up of time, and it's very expensive and valuable. And if we waste our time, we waste our life. And if we get hooked up to people who are not flowing with the Holy Spirit, they're flowing opposite of it because there is another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. And it's not from God. So what this course is going to teach you, we're going to walk through the Bible and glean the wisdom of God. That's our quest. We're searching for that. We want to get a hold of this one thing because everything in the Bible is hooked up to the wisdom of God, knowing Jesus, knowing the Father, being led by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, <clears throat> look at the top of your page, and it says homework. Read Proverbs chapter what? We will discuss it April the 12th. That's next month. Now, you need to write this down because it's going to say it there. In your words, tell me what you think the verses in chapter 9 are saying. Tell me the main theme. Just a few words. You don't have to write a hundred words. If you can do it in ten, I'd like that. <laughs> but you don't have to write a book. You just have to... What I want to know, I want to see if you can read some information and retain it and tell me about it. Why do you want to do that? Because that's how you learn the Word of God. Now... You have all month till, till April the 12th, from now to April the 12th, to just read Ch uh, Proverbs chapter 9. I don't know, I think it's 10 or 15 verses maybe at the most. Now, somebody find Job 28, 28. We're going to go through this quickly because this is not what I'm teaching today, but I want to do this with you. Job 28, 28. If you get it, read it. And to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. To know the fear of God is wisdom. Do you know God? I didn't ask you if you were saved. Do you know Jesus is Lord? You have to know that to get saved, right? Well, that's entrance level information. Did you know some Christians stay that the rest of their whole life? It's entrance level information. Jesus is Lord, basic, to the whole foundation of everything. You've got to have that right. But read it from, you You in it, Pastor, read the Proverbs, I'm sorry, Job 28, 28 from your Amplified. What man is there, behold, reverential, and worship the whole fear of the Lord. That is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Oh, 
hope. So you get wisdom which produces what? Understanding. You can't understand anything if you don't have wisdom to comprehend what you're reading. So what we want to do, now listen, let me say it one more time. These are college level classes, but you can do them if you didn't go to the eighth grade. Because you have the Holy Spirit and He will reveal His Word to you. It's been given to reveal the deep things of God to you so you can understand them. See, Smith Wigglesworth was an illiterate, illiterate and shook the whole world. Shook the whole world, did more miracles than were recorded of Jesus. Didn't do more than Jesus did, but more than that were recorded in the Bible. He did more. He raised 50-something people from the dead and has documents from the doctor to prove that they were dead. Who was this guy? A man full of the Holy Ghost that never read a newspaper or any other publication or book or paper or anything except the Bible. And he couldn't even read it when he started. Yeah. So, we, the guy comes to me and says, well, I only have an eighth grade education and this is college level. I can't do it. I said, yeah, you can do it. You don't want to do it. Well, it's hard. Everything's hard. You just have to learn. So, but we have a little step up on other people. We got the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach us all things. Okay. The wisdom of God will bring you to the knowledge that will deliver you. Number two, supreme acquisition. Somebody read Proverbs 4 7. And you can, somebody else look up Proverbs 9 1 because we need to move through this quickly. This is really a homework page. But. Get wisdom and then you get what? Oh, we got knowledge, now we get understanding. Why should we search the scriptures night and day? Knowledge and understanding. How's it coming? Through the wisdom of God's Word. This book is alive. It's alive. When you read it, it reads you. It is, it's alive. I've read it many times and been messed up with whatever and in the word I said, oh my God, I get convicted. Just close the page. Then go back and read it again. Wisdom brings knowledge and understanding. Who can be wise? Anybody that can believe God's word. But after you read it, you have to do it. See, you read the whole Bible over and over and over and over and over and form your own doctrines out of it because your lack of understanding it and you can get yourself so messed up that you can never get saved and never know anything, not have any knowledge or understanding. This is speaking of God. But men of God have invented some of the greatest inventions in the world. What was his name? Invented peanut butter. Carter? Was his name Carter? Carver. Uh, he had a, a African American school and had no money. He said, God, I ain't got nothing but peanuts. I got a peanut crop. What can I do with that? Every store you go in, every house you go in America, they got peanut butter. He also invented stoplights. Did you know that? He invented stoplights. Witty inventions. The Bible said, God will give us witty inventions. But you have to study it. You have to get any wisdom. Brings knowledge and understanding and witty inventions. God to give you a ministry. He's trying to, to take care of a, a college and being oppressed all the time. He's trying to do it. Do it. But he said, hey, all I got is peanuts. What can I do with peanuts? Peanut butter. <laughs> and then they said, the dollars started rolling in eventually. Here come the check. <laughs> How'd you get that money? God, wisdom of God showed me how to do it. Are you getting into that? We, we learned a whole lot. We had three scriptures. Hosea, no, Proverbs 9 1, please. Anyone? Wisdom built what? A house? 
It'll build your house. Did you know that you are spirit? You have a soul and you live in the body? This is your house. Didn't the Bible say we are the temple of God? This is your house. You can build your house on the word of God with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And you can do things that nobody else can do that's in your same position and your shape. You'll step out from where you were and you'll be somewhere else. We're in a quest. We're in a journey. And we're going to walk with the wisdom of God through these scriptures. And it's going to change our life. I feel the Holy I'm going to preach. Whew. I'm getting excited already. But listen, I couldn't even read hardly when I went to Bible school. And I found one scripture in the Bible. Somebody said, will you tell me that scripture? I said, no. It's up to you for $500. No. 1 Corinthians 1.30 said, Jesus has been made unto me wisdom. And I said, hmm. And I started quoting that scripture and I started reading. And I get to a word. And uh, a good friend of mine said, I'm going to give you the best friend you ever had in your life. Here. A dictionary. Just a regular dictionary. Wasn't it great or Hebrew or nothing? He said, when you see a word that you don't know, look it up and find out what it means. Because you're missing something. Wisdom will build your house. They don't want to build your house to help you build a house or get a house or a car or whatever you need. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, power to build comes from the Word of God. Is this okay, guys? Amen. <clears throat> Number three, apprehends divine truth. Hosea 14, 9. Somebody read that. Hosea, you guys can look ahead and pick out one and get ready when I call. Be wise and he shall understand these things. Prove and he shall know them. Be wise and what would it, did it say? Be wise and he shall understand these things. I am proof. You want to understand and know it? What do you think prudent means? You don't have to. I'm going to tell you. Get ready to write it down. <clears throat> prudent means wisdom applied to practical matters. The word prudent there means wisdom applied to practical matters. It has the thought of caution and shrewdness. When you're prudent, it means you have wisdom, wisdom to apply to practical matters. It gives you caution and shrewdness. Hmm. Is that good? I like that. Do you like word studies? If you don't like words, you can't, you can't be a preacher. Uh, well, you can, but not a very good one. You have to understand what the book says. See, we can go in one part of a book and start reading something. We think that's what it says. First time I got a message, I mean a real one from God, I got a little part of it. I said, oh my God, I'm going to preach this tomorrow. And the Lord said, you ain't even got it yet. I said, well, I've got this part. He said, it's line up on line and precept on precept. You have to keep it in context and read other scriptures in context that fit that context. Line upon line, precept. How can we do that? Only by the Holy Spirit. That's what He's given to us to reveal the deep things of God. Gosh, you guys brought the Holy Ghost with you today. <laughs> prudent. I want to be prudent. It means wisdom applied to practical matter matters, and it also has the thought of caution and shrewdness. I love that. Number four, wisdom lays a what does that say? A what? What kind of foundation? All right, Matthew 7, 24. I'm going to go with you, but I'm going to let you read. Matthew 7, 24. You know it, but let's read it.
Here I'm going to read it. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever, whosoever means me. Say me. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and what's the next two words? Whosoever heareth these words of mine, and does them, not hears them, and doesn't do them, I will liken him unto a what kind of man? Which builds his house upon the rock. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, these teachings of mine, these doctrines in here of mine, not my teaching, his teaching. This is Jesus speaking. Now watch. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth what? Doeth them not. So he said if you do it in verse 24, look, that was verse uh, 26. Verse 24 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on a rock. Verse 25. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on what? Who's the rock? And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house on the sand and the rains... Now, do you see the difference between a wise man and a foolish man? He built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew against that house or beat against that house and it fell and great. And the word great, I looked it up this morning, is terrible. And terrible was the fall of it. I know some men's houses that are falling down today and it's terrible what's overtaken them. You want me to tell you why? They heard the word, but they didn't do the word. They didn't make a commitment to the word. Why? Because commitment costs you something. The word commitment in the Bible in Psalms 37 means to bind yourself to God. You bind yourself to God. You make a commitment. And the minute you do, God can count on you. And the minute He can count on you, you can count on Him for everything because He'll bring you through. But it's a commitment. You have to do it when you're hungry. You have to do it when your car's broke down. You have to do it when you don't have any money. You have to give to the poor when you, you think you're the poor. So I can't give no money. I can put up poor myself. How much you got in there? 20. Well, give them five. The Bible's hard to do. Who said it was easy? But the results are wonderful. <laughs> and the end result is going to be wonderful for eternity. Praise the Lord. I'm trying to have a revival. I'm trying to teach a Bible lesson. I'm getting blessed. I don't know if you are or not. Now listen to this. Listen. The storm in your life is not the deciding factor. Both houses have a storm. But the storm is not the deciding factor. It's where your life is with God. If you're built on the foundation, the storm's going to come to my house just like it is yours. But if I've heard the word and I'm doing the word, my house is going to stand. Yeah. And somebody said, boy, he really has good luck. What luck got to do with it? He's so fortunate. No, just keep on serving God. The storms in your life are not the deciding factor. Both houses had a storm. Only one fell. Why? Because that man was wise. Oh, he went to college. No, he read the book and did what it said. This is above a college level book. <laughs> There's some complicated stuff in here, but with the Holy Ghost, it becomes simple. God said to me, you preach too simple. It couldn't be this easy. This is, it's not this easy to do this. I said, it is. The only problem is, you have to have a character change. You've got a flaw in your foundation. And if you don't take care of that flaw in your foundation, your foundation will crumble and the fall will be terrible. I have to go up the mountain to live in a cave. I'm not going there. I'm not going to have evil communications which corrupt good manners. 
I'm not going to join myself to some guys preaching half of the gospel. Or three quarters of it either. The parts you're leaving out is the parts that's going to do you in. You can't do one or two or all. You have to do all of this. So God said, my God, that's impossible. It is without the Holy Spirit. That's the reason He gave you a Holy Spirit. After that, the Holy Spirit taught you. He'll lead and guide you into all the truth. John 17, 17, 7. Thy word is truth. After that, the Holy Spirit taught you. lead and guide you into all the truth. And show you something to come. Now, that's prophetic. Now it's, He's going to show you into the future. Well, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be. You are a preacher anyway. Got enough word of you if you stand up and let it loose. God do something powerful with it. Instead of trying to adjust it and tune it and fix it and make it sound palatable to some people. Uh, the, to some people, the preaching of, of the cross and the word and stuff, it's an offense. They don't like it. Well, I don't care. Am I going to change what I'm preaching because they don't like it? No. If you don't like where I preach, go some other place and <laughs> listen to them. I, listen, I got your blood on my hands today. Did you know that? If I don't tell you the truth, but if I tell you the truth, I'm not responsible. I'm going to tell you the truth every time I see you. That way you like it or not. I'm not going over there and say, Pastor Dan, no more. He's too real. God told me that. I said, I'd rather, I'd rather be real than phony, wouldn't you? Yeah. Wisdom lays an irremovable. <laughs> say the word, somebody. Thank you. It means you can't remove it. You can't change it. You can't break it. Go to 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8, somewhere. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. Do you think the devil's smart? Do you think the devil's helpers are smart? No. 1 Corinthians 2, 6. Listen. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And that word means mature. Are you a mature Christian? If you come to this class, when you get through with it, you will be. Are you going to do it, Pastor Dan? Are you crazy? No, this book's going to do it. See, I studied the Bible not so I could get one up on you, but so that I could know what to do. Because I could build my house with wisdom so it won't fall. But one guy said, well, you're always using one-upmanship. I said, no, I'm just talking about something you don't know anything about. You've been in the ministry longer than me. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are mature, Yet not the wisdom of the world. I don't care if some guy's got 29 PhDs. If he don't know God, he's stupid. He's a fool. The Bible said he is foolish. Amen. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are, are mature yet? Not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to nothing. The kings, the princes, the billionaires, the rich people that don't serve God, don't know God. You envy them. I feel sorry for them. And I said, don't you, don't you wish you was like that? I said, uh-uh. What's that guy that Flint that used to make pornography magazine, now he's got a gambling place in L.A. or something? Yeah. He, he's rich, filthy rich. And I heard a Christian one time at a men's meeting me say, you know, Boy, I envy that guy all the money he's got. And me and my big mouth, I said, I don't envy him. I feel sorry for him. Amen. Everything he knows and everything he's got is going to burn up. And if he don't get saved, he's going to go to hell. Sure. And what good will your money do you then? The devil don't even like money. He just uses it to snare you. He don't need no money. What would he need money for? He's a spirit. He just hooks us with it. Watch this. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of who? In a mystery. Oh, it's a mystery. Oh, no. Every time you see mystery in the Bible, God explains it if you keep on reading. 
But we speak the word. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. But we know that now God has given us the Holy Spirit. And He's come to reveal all the deep things of the mysteries of God. Which God ordained before the world. Unto our glory. God knew what He was doing. Listen. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They thought they were so smart. What did the Jews say? Crucify him, crucify him. We're the only church. We're the ones representing God. Crucify him. They didn't know anything. Oh, yes, I'm over here at church, do that, and I'm this over there, and I'm that, do nothing. And me either, without the wisdom of God. Can't you see the devil when they crucified Jesus? He says, oh, come on, boys. <laughs> Look, we got him, we got him. And when he rose from the grave, when he rose from the grave, he said, oh, my God, he's back. We can't kill him. He came back. Can't kill us either. We're coming back. Hallelujah. We're coming back. He said, they weren't, they weren't smart. They were stupid. Had they known it, they'd have never crucified. Lord, they would never put him on the cross if they knew what he was going to do. Can I tell you something? The devil still cannot interpret prophecy. In the garden of Eden, God told the devil exactly what he's going to do. And did you know he didn't even know who he was? That's trying to kill all them little babies. Had the king killed them, had them all killed trying to get didn't even trust Jesus. He was already gone now in the country. God's a, not one step ahead of us. He's a million miles ahead of us. Didn't kill him. You know, when he finally knew it really was Jesus, when he was baptized, because he heard the Father speaking out of heaven, said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then in the form of a dove, so they could see it. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. But so they could see it, the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and sat on it. And God the Father spoke to him and the people heard it. The devil is stupid. And I always say, if you follow a false prophet, you're not as smart as they are. If you follow God, you're smart. I don't need money. I don't, I don't have to pay preachers money to get blessed. Who told you that? That's a lie out of the pit of hell. Jesus paid the price. We're going to, we're going to study it later. Jesus paid the price for your salvation, your healing, your redemption. What are you paying for? In South Central, there's some churches you're going to get prayer for, for healing. You have to, they don't, they say, remember the offering now. Put your offering in and then come on up. We'll pray for it. What are they doing? Charging for healing. Jesus paid the price. By his stripes you are healed. He bore our sins in his body. On the cross and by his stripes you are and you were, Isaiah 53, healed. You're already healed. You know, he paid the price. It cost you nothing. It's free. Amen. I ain't paying nothing. I went to church and the guy said, now everybody wants to be rich and just form a line. Be rich. I am rich. It depends on what you call rich. I, I, I call having a relationship with God. And being imperfect as I am and making mistakes, He still loves me and He forgives me and His mercy endures forever. And He helps me when I'm weak. And when I fall, He don't kick me. He picks me up. He cleans me up and He's been holding me up and sustaining me all my life. That's rich. I don't love money. I need money. You do too. It's a tool. But I don't love it. They said, I go to church and, and the pastor said we'd all get a loan on our house and give him the money so he could enlarge the ministry. In 90 days, we'll get a hundredfold return. She called him on the phone. I said, that's a lie. She said, no, I'll read it to you right now. And it says, in your lifetime with persecutions. She said, he didn't say that. I said, no, he conveniently left that out. But it's not just money, it's Houses and lands and mothers and sisters, God's going to bless you. But then say in 90 days. She said, He said in 90 days. I said, It says, In your lifetime with persecution. She said, What's persecution? I said, That's trials, tribulations, and trouble. I said, Lord, I asked you for a million dollars. You never gave it to me. He said, I did. 
five here, ten there, a dollar there. He said, if you add it up, be more than a million. I said, but I want it all at once. You don't get it all at once. Am I making sense to you? Jesus paid for everything. He said, come without money, didn't he? And without money, the more places said, you don't need the money. Every church is like, we've got to have the money. I'll get up for you today. And you, my Bible study, you can get up and get the money out of it. I heard a preacher say, <laughs> you know who it is. He said, if you don't pay your tithes today, God might send the devil to your house and he could kill you. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> he could kill you. And my wife said, since when did God and the devil join up as a tag team? <laughs> I said, I got one even better. The devil is God's hit man. If you don't pay your tithes, he sends the devil to your house and kills you. I said, tell me you didn't say that. She said, he said, please tell me you didn't say that. Oh, yeah, he did say that. No wisdom from God. You know what they got? Maybe a talent to speak. Maybe they can, they can grasp some of it. But if you don't walk it out in your life, you won't be able to do it. I won't? No. What if you go to school to learn to be a transmission mechanic? But you cheat and copy off of other people. You don't really do the work. And when you do the work... Uh, you barely get through it. And then you graduate. I want you to work on my transmission. Because you only read and did the easy parts and let all the others say. We have to require something of ourselves. Jesus made himself of no reputation. Reputation is who people think you are. But he took on, on himself the form of a servant, even unto death itself. Jesus didn't have a reputation, but he did. But his reputation came out of his character. Character is what you are. Reputation is what people think you are. They can think you're the greatest thing in the whole world when you can be a fool, out of the will of God, not teaching the gospel, and being led by another spirit, and they don't even know the difference. Oh, I love that church over there. We're all going to get rich over there. Well, how come he's driving a Mercedes and you riding a bicycle? I went to uh, South Central and preached in a huge church. The guy used to be with Fred Price and he left him and went down and built this church. It's huge. All them people driving Cadillacs. And he preaches the word too. And moves under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. What's the difference? So you can't judge people. I don't have to judge them. I can tell them by the fruits. If they're lying to me, they're a liar. If they say something that's contrary to this, they're not telling you the truth. They're telling you a lie. And if you listen to a lie and believe a lie, you can be damned. God will turn you over to a reprobate mind after a while. And you'll think, boy, I'm really up here with that. I'm just strutting. I'm doing everything. I... And you're not doing anything. Most people in churches are religious. They have a religious spirit. That's the most dangerous spirit in the world. Kill you. That's what killed Jesus. Most people were religious. Said this guy's coming into town, and everybody in the whole city is following him. And they're hollering no Santa to him, throwing down palm leaves, and they're worshiping him. We got to get rid of this guy. You know why? He might mess up our business. He'd be getting more money than we're getting up here in the temple, and we we got to get rid of him. And they did too, didn't they? But you know what? They sealed their fate. The Lord knew he was going to be betrayed, but he said, Well, one to him that does it. Judas is not the only one that's betrayed God. We've got churches full of people that have. And, and a lot of them are preachers. I was in this church. <laughs> I stopped telling this story. I was in this church, and the pastor said, We, we don't go into no Pentecostal stuff. I said, Okay, and I was preaching. He went, Ooh. <laughs> I didn't say that. And I looked at us. I kept preaching to him. Something's on him. <laughs> and it was the Holy Ghost. He's got up too close. He was after a while he got up and went, Woo, 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 woo. Said, I don't know what's wrong with me. 
your pastor? I said, I do. Sit down. He said, what, what's going on? I said, that's the Holy Ghost. I said, one thing I know about you, you saved, aren't you? He said, yeah, I know the Holy Ghost. I said, well, how long has been since you done that? He said, oh, about 40 years. He got educated. He got sophisticated. And then he got complicated. Well, You know, the Bible called people stupid. He said the pastors were brutish. Look the word up, it means stupid. <laughs> I thought it meant they were brutal. No, it means they were stupid. He said, Boy, well, under the pastors, the brutish, stupid, scattering the flock, tearing up the church, preaching false doctrine. Jesus came down one day and paid a little visit to the temple, and he had what did he have in his hand? He didn't beat everybody out. Just those that used the church for their own good and to make money off of other people inside the church, he took a whip and beat them out. And if he showed up here today and we were doing that, he'd, take, he'd whip us. I tell you, my mama was a, a God-fearing person, a missionary and a preacher, but she could whip the fire out of you. She said, I'm doing this because I love you. I, I said the wrong thing. I said, I don't think so. Man, she gave me a few more things. But you know what? I needed that. That's what's wrong with kids today. Right. If, if you spank one of them today, they put you in jail. Right. Do you, who do you think made that law? The devil. You know what the Bible says? The rod of construction of <laughs> instruction. What will it do to them? Out of what? I learned not to play in the street. Remember what we're saying, Tim? You don't listen, you have to feel. They're going to feel something one of these days. People that depart from the Word. Why am I saying all this? It's got to do with wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Once you know this, nobody can ever lead you into false doctrine. Nobody can ever rob you of your money. Nobody can ever charge you to get healed because you can go home and get healed yourself. Just anoint yourself with oil and pray. You believe that he died for your healing? Believe it's in atonement? No. Why would you pay somebody else? If you want to pay somebody, pay Jesus. Oh, he, he can't receive money. No, he wants your worship. He wants your service. He wants your commitment to him and his word. If you do that, you will get the money. I didn't say you'd be a millionaire. I hope you are. If you are, remember me. <laughs> Instead of when you come into your kingdom, when you come into your millions, remember me. No, I'm joking. But listen, you will have everything that you need. <clears throat> Let's go on. Go to number five. Scriptures are the source of wisdom. Second Timothy. Anybody got 2 Timothy? What? what 2 Timothy 3.15. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, wow. Now, just read from the Amplified. 2 Timothy 3.15. And how from your childhood you have had a knowledge of and been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you to give you the understanding for salvation, which comes through the faith of Christ Jesus, through the leading of the entire human personality of God and Christ Jesus, in absolute trust confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. Hmm. The scriptures are the source of the wisdom of God. No man could write this book. No man. Because it goes against everything that man believes. 
This book tells the truth. Even when they fail in this book, the leaders, the priests, what well, it exposes them. It doesn't cover it up and say, oh no, they were all perfect, wonderful men and women. Some of them are a bunch of devils and it exposes them. Moses was a mighty man of God. Did he get to go over in the Holy Land? Why? Hit the rock twice. That rock represented Christ. said, smote it once. He got angry. Quack, quack. He said, you're not going to go, Moses, but come up here and I'll let you see it. Look out over there. That's what you could inherit. Who's going to inherit? Joshua. The children of Israel. Who was Joshua? He walked behind Moses for, what, 70 years. Trained under a man that stood in the very presence of God and God talked to him. I like that. But Moses didn't get to go. But Joshua did. Caleb too. There were men of faith. Strong men of faith. That's what we want to be. I'm not going to compromise what God has given me in the Bible to please you or to please all of you or to please everybody. And somebody said, well, you know what? With that kind of attitude in these last days, you'll get killed. Well, so what? So what? You're going to die anyway, some way. I'd rather die believing in God than die denying Him. Because like they did in the Inquisition back then, and uh, they, they said, if you'll deny Christ, we won't kill you. They said, okay, as soon as they denied Christ, they killed them because they knew what the Bible said. Okay, I'll deny Christ. Then they kill you. You should have just believed God and said, no, I'm not going to deny him. They killed you, but you see the difference? You've got to take a stand for God. You've got to get your mind straight. You've got to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, which will cause you to have witty inventions, give you power that, that you can't tap into any other way. See, this book is, is loaded with power facts that will cause you to be a success. It's not about what God won't do. It's about what God will do. But it is about what God will do to you if you won't do what He wants you to do. That's the part they leave out today. Oh, everything's sweet. You'll be okay. I heard a preacher, and oh, don't ask me later either, I won't tell you, but if I told you, you'd know. He said, I had a good friend. He, he had a little problem. And he got to drinking, and he was with a lady, and they got in adultery and stuff, and they had a car wreck, and they got killed. But thank God, they're in heaven today. My Bible says no drunkard or adulterers are going to heaven. I beg your pardon. If that was true, everybody in the world is going to heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. It's going to be too wonderful. Eternity is going to be too long to miss heaven. And hell is sure going to be hot. I don't want to go there for eternity. No, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. It's a struggle. It's a fight. Sometimes I have to get down on the floor a day and just pray, intercede, and plead. And, and, but I'm, I'm not giving up with the help of God. I can't do it on my own, but with Him, all things are possible if we can believe. All things. He loves you so much. You are so important to Him. You are so precious. He, he put the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You all of all power. Anointed by the Holy Spirit. The anointing is the Holy Spirit. And you got it. God told me one time, He said, I've never been to a Bible school like this. He said, you do teach, but you preach it too. And, and I'm getting all excited, and I didn't write my stuff down. I said, you better learn to write it down. <laughs> Don't get excited. <laughs> now listen. Wisdom is full of spiritual fruits. I was looking at this last week, and I went, oh, my gosh. Look at this. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 17. Well, let's look at 16. For where there's envy and strife, and where envy and strife is, there is confusion and what? Ever evil work. But look at 17. But the wisdom that is from God is first pure, and it's peaceable and gentle, 
and easy to be entreated and full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. This is talking almost like about the, the fruits of the Spirit. Gentle, kind, long-suffering. The wisdom of God is full of spiritual fruit. Well, what's that? Why do we need that? We shall know you by your fruits. Not by you, what you say about yourself. God said to me, I've told it here many times, but maybe you haven't heard it. Uh, he said, I was at a pastor's convention. He said, hey, you know what? I said, no, no. He said, I'm on the top ten list of preachers in America. I said, you are? He said, you know, I said, where's the list? He said, well, there ain't really a list. I said, then how do you know you're the top of the top ten? He said, well, I just know I am. He said, I, I, I knew everything in the whole Bible. I said, you do? He said, I do. And he said, if there was a list, I'd be top ten on it. What was he demonstrating? It was pride on parade. He wasn't only full of pride. He was parading it around in front of everybody. And didn't even know it. What's wrong with him? No wisdom. No knowledge. No understanding. It's all about his uh, $500 suit. And them shoes probably a thousand. Oh yeah, you can get some ostrich and other stuff. thousand dollars for a pair of shoes. He was really duty it all up. Pride on parade. Going through life and he's his own parade. <laughs> and what he is putting on parade is his pride and arrogance. I'm glad that I'm an idiot that's been saved, filled with the Spirit of God. I remember where I come from. You haven't forgotten, folks, where you come from, have you? I still remember where I came from. You remember where you came from? Now, you see number seven and number eight? <clears throat> um, number seven says the preciousness of, of wisdom. This is homework for you, so out there somewhere write homework, but don't write it. See, uh, A, Proverbs 3, 13 through 14 with a little dash. I want you to just write in as very few words as possible what, that, what that's saying. Same thing, Proverbs 8 and 11, just write right there behind it, just your little thought that you got from that. And Ecclesiastes in 17. And all of these down here. Now you have a whole month. I didn't say they had to be put completely correct. But can you read like Proverbs 3, 13 and 14. And tell me what that says. Well can I use a, a commentary? You can if you want to. But can't you figure it out? Just read the scripture and pray. And say what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. And I'll give you a little paper next week. That tells you how to. Interpret scripture, okay? You take it at face value in its most common setting and it means what it says. You can attach a bunch of other stuff to it if you want to, but now you're messing with the gospel. Just leave it alone. It's simple. So what you're going to do is you're going to read Proverbs chapter 9 and in your own words tell me what you think those verses are saying. And kind of tell me what the main theme is. The main theme could be if it was talking about sin, sin. Or whatever. And that you just write one word. What is the main theme of chapter 9? You'll know as soon as you read it. And that's all you have to do with that. You don't have to go verse by verse through that. Just tell me what's the main theme. And in your words tell me what you think this verse is saying. And then when you go to 7 and 8, the same thing. You just read Proverbs 3, uh, 3 13 through 14. And you write in there what you think that's saying to you. And do it from 7 through 8 and uh, bring your paper with you next time and don't be embarrassed listen I'm not going to read your paper in front of people and say ha 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 boy you really messed up that's not I'm not going to say anything I'm going to tell you later this is what you need to do I'll just write it on there you take it home and, and you can study it again and you'll begin to see see we're not going to embarrass you or we're not going to fail you either you know why because you ain't getting down here until you pass <laughs> I've been going over this school now nine years. Pastor Dan won't leave me alone. He comes and gets me every Saturday and makes me come. But I'm not going to let you get out of here until you pass. 
Why? Because these words are so important to you. It will change your life and cause you to become something you can't be. Listen to what Paul said. God put me in the ministry because he found me faithful. And then he said, and he enabled me. See, you can put yourself in the ministry. But the enablement comes from God. And without it, you're just somebody saying something. But with the enablement that comes through the power of the Holy Ghost, it means He gives you the ability to do or become something you can't do on your own. A guy said to me, I want to be a preacher so bad. I said, how much of the Bible do you read? He said, I don't read any. I said, you ain't going to make it. He said, well, I mean, I read it some. I said, how much? Well, you know, I've got a lot of other things to do. You don't have anything to do more important than this. I didn't say quit your job and sit home and read the Bible all day. God told me one time he did that and he's living on faith. I said, no, the Bible says we live by faith, not on it. I'm sorry, I can't say on and ask, right? Because I'm from somewhere where we don't say those words, right? He <laughs> owned it. I said, one time, Julie was translating, I said, God put his own arms around us. And she said, what's that mean? I said, never mind, I'll tell you that. It don't make any difference where you come from. What city did you come from in Mexico? Well, you can't be saved because you've never been born in America. Everybody in America is a Christian. No, they're not. The idiot said that on the 700 Club. They're interviewing him on the street. He said, you're a Christian. He said, I was born in America, wasn't it? Yeah, you can be saved. Anybody can be saved. Process, there's a transition that you're going to make. You're going to go from here to way over there. And in a few years, you're going to say, How did I ever get here? I remember when I was over there, mad with everybody, and upset, and couldn't get along with anybody. One guy said, I've been married five times. I said, What's wrong with you? Nothing. It's them and the women out there. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's <laughs> It's not him at all. He didn't do anything. He's perfect. We're not perfect at all. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. We're just saved. There's no such thing as sinless perfection in the earth. If there was, 1 John 1 9 wouldn't be in the Bible. If you sin, it confesses sin, he'll forget. Why would it be in there? It's not for sinners. 1 John is not written to sinners. Sinners get saved from the original sin. We get forgiveness for the sins we commit since we've come to Christ. That's the difference. We're going we're gonna to stop sin now. <laughs> we're going to fellowship all and eat donuts and drink coffee. Yes, ma'am? Sure. Well, praying in tongues, there is the tongues of angels. It's mentioned one time. But it says the tongues of men. On the day of Pentecost, they all heard them speaking in what? Their own language. They understood it on the day of Pentecost. Now, <clears throat> listen. All tongues are in a language that does or did exist. Some are not in existence anymore. But God didn't forget them. When on the day of Pentecost, they heard, every person there heard the disciples speaking in their language. Then there's the language of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives as you pray and it can begin. Starts coming out. Could that be a language of men? Yes. Now let me tell you something. I went to college. <laughs> One word. You can add one syllable to it in foreign languages and it becomes a different word. Or you can say, Shanda, like that, and it means somewhere you can say, Shanda. And that means something. In the expression of your voice, loudness or softness, you could get three words in tongues and you could pray in that and it could become larger and larger. Did you see that it did that? You started off going like something and then you pretty soon you just really prayed in tongues. There are everyone dialects. 
that was so used. Some of them probably yeah. in the beginning of time, we don't know even what they were. They were written down. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, the Holy Spirit came, and they began to speak in tongues, and everybody understood them. Now, I prayed for a lady in Mexico City who spoke no English, never spoke English in her life, and she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she spoke in tongues. Guess what they were? English. She was saying, glory to God, hallelujah. I said, oh, I thought, I don't know, she spoke English. He said, she don't. He was her friend. She don't know how she did. He said, how she did. He said to me, how she do that? I said, oh, she's preaching and speaking in English. I know a preacher that got up and preached, and at the end of the message, he gave a tongue. And tongues in the church really is more for believers. Did you know it says that? Well, we don't want to have tongues because some unbeliever might be offended. No, they're drawn by it. Anyway, he stood up and he gave this message in tongues after he got through uh, preaching that morning. And he said, it sounded really strange. And it went on and on and on and on and on. And you know, sometimes you'll hear a tongue in message and a tongue, and then the message will be real short or sometimes real long. You're not in, you're not uh, translating it. You're interpreting it's called interpretation of tongues. So they might say in, in their own language within themselves, Jesus is Lord and I love him so. But they, in tongues it may be blah, 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 and it would be long or it could be even shorter than that. But we do speak with the men of tongues and angels. It says that. But I don't know how to articulate the language they speak in heaven through the angels. Do you? Do you know what it is? No, I don't know what it is. I don't know some of these dialects that... Uh, did you know that there's a place in Africa that they speak by making clicks? Stuff like that. I heard them one time. I said, what are they doing? And, and this guy said, well, listen. They're talking to each other. I said, they're not talking. They're popping their lips and making noises. No, it was words to them. So, you know, people want to get crazy about all that stuff. Let them get crazy about it. The guy said to me one time, what did you think about my subject? I said... Interesting, but stupid. He said, why? I said, it was interesting, but it was stupid. It don't make no sense. It doesn't address anything. It don't mean anything. What is God thinking in heaven now? How do you know? Whatever it is, it's good. <laughs> it's going to help somebody. Let's go have something to eat. Lord, we thank you for this class this morning. Ask you to bless us food and nourishment to our body in Jesus' name. And now, you need to get a blank sheet of paper. If you have one. Bible. Uh, I thought I brought some blank sheets with me today, but I didn't, so maybe you can write these down. You got a piece of paper you can write them on. Because I'm going to share something with you about walking with the wise. Uh, some of the things that we mentioned a little bit in that what we did this morning. I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you real quickly. We'll be out, I think, by 1130. I'm going to share with you walking with the wise and uh, choose your friends carefully. And that's probably all we'll get today. And then every every time we come and have a lesson like we did today and you get your homework, I will share with you from that and then I will share a couple of other things with you along those lines. More like a small summary. Uh, I want to thank you for coming today. I know that uh, I had a, a, one pastor call me and say he couldn't make it today. He had some going to his church and what have you. Now, we have some meetings in, in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, uh, our Shepherd's Rest meetings. They're getting more and more people all the time. We'll have one there the 22nd of this month in uh, L.A., and I don't have the address with me, but if you're interested, call me and I'll give you the address. Pastor Dan, you've been over there. What? Temple Street. It's on Temple Street, but I can't remember the address. You have too. Can you remember the address? Yeah, it's on Temple Street in Los Angeles. If uh, Call me, and I'll, I'll get it to you. Uh, we meet there the third Saturday of every month. We meet here the first Saturday of every month. Now, this, what is this? This is the third. 
third Saturday, we're going to meet there the fourth Saturday, and the first Saturday I meet at their church and teach a Bible study over there. Yes, sir. It should be. If it's not, anybody got a calendar? It don't sound like it would be, does it? Unless the month is beginning right on. Yeah. The 19th, change April 12 to April 19th. That's the first mistake I've made in years. <laughs> um, I make moose up. <clears throat> so it's <clears throat> so our means April the twelfth. No, the nineteenth instead of the twelfth. So change it on your homework. If you come April the twelfth, we won't be here. <laughs> it's April nineteenth instead of the twelfth for your homework, and we'll be here the nineteenth. I can't keep it all straight. First of Saturday of the month with you guys. The second is somewhere. The third is here and LA is the fourth. Saturday. I got too many places just now. You're saying you meet here on the first Saturday? No. The third Saturday only here. The first Saturday at his church. And uh, then in LA and than other places. I'm on a mission. I'll be here that Wednesday and then the following. 17th. The 17th. Yeah. There's so many churches. I've got so many churches. I don't have my calendar with me. I can't keep them straight. I just had it in my head that you say you make a weekend on Saturdays. And so that's not what you meant. You said exactly what you meant on September 17th. Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. And then the following, the 17th, I'll be here on Wednesday. And that is part of this. I'm incorporating that into this so we can just, we're doing three of them here, see? And that way I don't have to go somewhere else and try to do one or whatever, so. And Jess is making me do it. I didn't want to, but he told me that I had to do it. No, I'm just telling Okay, get a separate sheet of paper. Don't forget on your homework page, if you don't change it, if you're like me, you go, oh, I'm supposed to be there the 12th. It's the 19th. Homework. Read, read Proverbs chapter 9. We will discuss it April 19th. That's when this, this lesson will continue. Now I'm going to lay these up here. If you want to get some extra ones, you can. If you don't, that's okay. Alright. Let's talk about two things if we have time. Walking with wise, walking with the wise. Write that down at the top of your page if you want. Walking with with wise people, or just walking with the wise. And we're going to read again Proverbs thirteen twenty. Someone. <laughs> almost killed me. <laughs> but we want to walk with wise people. 
And so I wrote a little note on the top of this this morning really early. It said, we're going on a walk with wisdom. Your life could change and you could never be the same or not, depending on what you do with what you've learned. Write this down, if you would, please. Walking with the wise, write number one. And I'm going to give you the words slowly. A student, be a student of those who have succeeded before you. Be a student of those who have succeeded before you. And under that you can write, appreciate the accomplishment of others. See, you don't know everything, I don't know everything, so we've got to be a student of those who have succeeded in their ministry before us, but not somebody that became a millionaire because they ripped people off, but someone who is truly a man or a woman of God that's teaching you the Word of God that causes your life to change. You want to be a student of those people. Why? Because they've succeeded before you. They made it work. If they didn't make it work, no thank you, I don't know what you did because it didn't work. Appreciate the accomplishments of others. Be a student of those who have succeeded before you and appreciate the accomplishment of other people. Paul said something, follow me as I follow Christ. You know where I get a lot of my stuff is out of the Pauline epistles. Paul's writings, most of it. Why? Because he had a revelation that the other disciples didn't have. When Peter first heard it, he said, did this stuff, he's teasing, it's hard, but yeah, it's right. But what he had, he had more revelation than they did, and they walked with Christ. So we can have as much revelation of God's Word as we're willing to read and study and obey and walk in it. We can understand it too. Number two, Absorb the wisdom of great men and women of God. How would I do that? Read the Bible. Absorb the wisdom of great men and women of God. Absorb it. Suck it up like a sponge. Where will I find these people? In the Bible. Don't read of great men in the world that accomplished something. No. Read about Moses. God really used Moses, but the first day in ministry, he murdered somebody. And I heard a preacher say, that's what most of us do when we first get in ministry. We kill more people than we have. <laughs> Don't do it ourselves in line. But, but God used him, and he did it in a mighty way, but he didn't get to enter the promised land because he did something God told him not to do. So we can absorb the wisdom of godly men and women of the Word of God, and we can find out what they did was right and what they did was wrong. But we need to learn it from this book. If you read more books about this book than you do this book, you're confused. And I'll tell you something else, you preach false doctrine. If you read more books than this book, you're confused and you teach false doctrine. I don't need a book to explain this book to me. I need the Holy Spirit He's been given to reveal the deep things of God. So, you know, I don't read after a lot of people. A few people, but not many. I uh, used to like uh, Pickett. I can't remember her first name now. She went on to be at the Lord. She had a Bible college in Texas. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Mm -mm. No, her name is Pickett. Uh, I can't remember. She has a book still in the Bible bookstore. Uh, she's the one I heard teach on the moods of the Holy Spirit and I didn't know he had any moods but you can grieve him and it goes on and on and on and on and someone else that did that was Catherine Kuhlman she taught on the moods of the Holy Spirit but Pickett Fuchsia Puckett or Fuchsia Pickett's her name she's written a lot of books and uh, and I don't believe everything she says, but everything that she says it lines up with the Word of God. See, before you ever start reading books about the Word, you better get this one down pretty good or you'd be led astray. You'll be in the shack. Read the book of the shack. 
People say it's wonderful. It's full of false doctrine. The guy's a new age and wrote it. Oh, I love that book. Well, you did? Does it line up with scripture? No. Everything people write is not godly. Absorb the wisdom of great men and women of God. How? Read about them in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read about Jesus. Read about Matthew, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them. Read about their wives. Learn. learn. Absorb that wisdom. See, did you know I know a lot of preachers they only read the Bible to get sermons? And they, they use proof text. That means they go through the Bible and get a lot of scriptures to just say the same thing about the same thing. And then they preach that. You don't, you don't get much input. Uh, read the Bible to read the Bible to be fed and to learn and to get this wisdom and understanding into you so that you can get a hold of something in here. Then as you read the Word of God, you can glean from it and it's in its right perspective instead of just your point of view. I, I love everybody, but I don't care nothing about their point of view. I want this point of view. I don't care what you think or what you do. and uh, I'm not mad at you or anything, but if you don't come from this perspective, I don't want to listen to you. What are you going to tell me? I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. I said, well, okay, tell me. What would it be? If you're going to preach me a sermon about the Bible, but you don't use the Bible, what are you using? Well, you can get these books. And, they, and I said, mm -hmm. you're giving people stale bread. You ought to have some kind of revelation on what you're preaching. You ought to understand what you're saying. You need to be in contact with absorbing this from here, not from listening to a tape by somebody else either. It's good to listen to a tape by somebody. I didn't say that or a CD or whatever. But you need to get the wealth of your information from the reference book. This is it. They're not the reference book. But Paul did say, follow me as I what? Well, how do we know if he's following Christ or not? You have to read the book to see what the book said that godly people do. And Timothy, he said, be an example to the body of Christ in word and in deed. And be careful of your doctrine so you and people who hear you can be saved. So that means if you listen to false doctrine, you might not be saved. I want to be saved. I am saved. I'm going to stay saved with the help of God. Now, value the counsel of learned people. Number three, value the counsel of the learned, not the ignorant, not the false prophet. Why should we do all this, Pastor Dan? He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Oh, I'm listening to Brother Doodad, and boy, he's a wonderful teacher. No, he's not. How do you know? Because I have a basic understanding of the Scriptures. I don't understand them all, but i got a basic understanding, and the New Testament doctrines, I know every one of them. Every one of them? Well, ain't that many. <laughs> but I know every one of them in the New Testament. Yes, if you start teaching on New Testament doctrine, if you're not coming from the Bible, I'm going to know that that's not from the Bible. Now, you might have got it out of a commentary. I didn't get this stuff out of a commentary. I wrote it all. Well, when's that make you? Nothing. Except I read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, and keep it in the context of what the subject is about. Did Judas go out and hang himself? He did, didn't he? Well, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, Go you and do likewise. That's what it says. So you could st stick them together and tell people to hang themselves. You fail God to go out and hang yourself. It said right here he did, and it says here, Go and do you likewise. That's not scriptural, is it? No. You don't know how many sermons are put together that way. Lots of them. God was kept preaching and preaching. I thought, I heard these sermons somewhere before. It sounds just like deep. Call of unto deep. Uh, what's in the Bible? And I thought, no. But I heard the same, same message. And then one day my wife was reading a book. She said, Dan, come here. Here's where this guy got this message. Deep. Call of unto deep. And it was somebody referring to it in a book she was reading. And I said, yeah, that's it. And I got to read it. And I said, it's word for word. Because we got the tape of it and we listened to it 
And I read the book, and it was, he copied it off of the guy's tape. Word for word. He didn't get that message from God. The guy that wrote it did. But he got it from that guy. Secondhand information. See, if I have revelation knowledge from the Word of God, doesn't mean different. It means new. It means more depth on what was there. It's not new. It's not changing it. But the Holy Spirit reveals the deep things of God. So I might read it and study it for 20 years and I might get something there that's not different and it's not brand new. It's the same thought, but there's more depth to it. Do you understand? But you can't change the Word of God. And why would you want to preach somebody else's sermon? There's an anointing that comes with God giving you the revelation and the information that you can't get off of a tape. But if I teach you my understanding of the Bible, and it's correct, I show you going to read the scripture before we do every one of them. Well, that's not your revelation, that's your head information. Did you ever go to a three-day meeting and come out there and floating on the clouds? You felt, ooh, man, I'm, I'm in revival in three days. Boom, you're back down again. Because you listen to somebody tell you what God showed them and did for them, and they preached it from the Word, and the hearing of the Word brings what? Faith. But you have to build a foundation to hold that faith on. So if you don't have your foundation solid, and you don't know the basic fundamentals of Christianity, you get let off. Or you'll have your hope in that message that I preached or somebody. Our hope is in Christ. And the message is to bring us uh, more wisdom and more knowledge and understanding of it. Why? So we can do it. It's not so we can look good. Or so we can say, oh yeah, I don't know everything in the Bible. I don't know everything in the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, when you go to a meeting and you sit in there for three days, you've taken in more than you can assimilate anyway. And you get all up, you're sort of jumping and hollering and everything, but that's not your revelation of it. You need to take that home and meditate on it day and night that you may see into that and see what God is saying through that. Because there's more than what's on the surface always. You read the scripture. There's more to that scripture than just what it said. When the work of the Holy Spirit is involved with it, He begins to uh, uh, elaborate on it and enlarge it and give you some more revelation from somewhere or other, some other places that fits right with that and it comes alive. If it's just somebody going, and the Lord said he loves you a lot and we need you to give an offering because we're about to go under and I need a new car and we need a new land. Huh? And the Lord said he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, bye. I get up and walk out. I did it before. God was preaching. I got up and walked out. He wasn't preaching at all. He was reading stuff out of a book. And it wasn't the Bible, but it looked like it. But I knew it wasn't the Bible because of the seven scriptures. They had been reading it out of something else. People don't need anything like that. What, what, what do they need that for? Today I'm going to tell you all about the ark. Well, I know all about it. I need to know. I read it in the Bible. And this is what I believe about the ark. I can start telling you about this stupid who cares? I know what it symbolizes. I know what it means. Let's do one more. Choose your friends carefully because we talked about these today. I wrote this down. Would you please listen to this? Your associations will unleash your possibilities or stifle your dream. You can write it down. Your associations will unleash your possibilities or stifle your dream. Can I say it again? Uh -huh. Your associations will unleash your possibilities or stifle your dreams. Scripture? I'll give you one. Somebody read it. We already read it once, but this just explains it in a little more depth than when I read 1 Corinthians 15.33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. 
We've had that in Corbin too. <clears throat> what does communications mean there? Companionships. Look it up when you get up. Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good manners. You can't run around with a skunk and smell like a rose. I said, man, where you been? Oh, I've been to the rose factory. No, you ain't. You smell like a skunk, man. <laughs> Something bad wrong with you. You've been in the wrong place. Communications in the Greek, you look it up in Strong's and you'll see it means companionships. So, if you're running around with people that are not right, not, not really living for God, not in the Word and, and praying like they should be, those associate, associations will either stifle your dreams They'll just stop you. They'd, see, that's the reason we get corrupted. We get with them and we start listening to their doctrine and we start assuming that because they said they love God, they really do. I've met some preachers that said they love God and they preach so gentle and kind and never offended anybody. And I never tried to. If I offend you myself, I apologize. If the Word of God offends you, you stuck with it. You're just going to have to get unoffended by repenting. But you get around people that are teaching false doctrine, you're half in and half out. You're corrupting yourself. It's going to stifle your dream. You need to get with somebody that will unleash your possibilities. How can they do that? Only as they teach you this. I don't want to hear your opinion about this if it's contrary to this. Do you? I don't want to hear your opinion about this book right here. If it's contrary to what this book right here says, then what are you telling me? Something to stifle my dreams. Something to rob me of my faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, not by hearing about something else or taking it out of context and giving you a message that's not going to bring you any deliverance at all. How do we get delivered? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That means we personally testify to what the blood of Jesus did for us as recorded here. That's what it means. It don't say, I overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. My testimony hasn't got saved in 1942. That's not your testimony. It means you testify personally to the fact of what Jesus' blood does according to this. That's how we overcome. Did you get it? They said, yeah, I overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. I want you to know I saved, sanctified, filled the Holy Ghost. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about I personally agree with what the Bible says the stripes and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ did in the shedding of His blood. It says you're healed by it, saved by it, delivered by it, everything by it. 1 Corinthians 15 says that the gospel is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. That is the gospel, the heart of it, and everything else comes out of that thing that he did at Calvary. If we don't know that, then we don't know nothing. Discern motives of people. Discern the motives. Let me tell you how you do that. You've heard the word love, right? Have you heard the word lust? Have you? Love, write this down. I'm going to go slow. Love gives at the expense of itself. Jesus loved us so much he did what? Love gives at the expense of itself. Jesus did. Lust takes of others at their expense. No. That's the lust. Did you know you can lust in your marriage and not love? Love gives at the expense of itself. Lust takes at the expense of somebody else. The Muslims say we have to die for Allah. They got to put on a bunch of bombs around the floor. Got to tell all over the street and we're going to heaven. 
Jesus died for us. Love gives at the expense of itself. Lust takes at the expense of others. Immediately, you know if you're in love or if you're in lust. And you can discern the motives of people around you. Why do they always talk to you about money? Why does every conversation in the platform come back to money? We got to have money. Because that's what's in their heart. Out of the bunch of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you believe it's more blessed to give than receive? Then you ought to give more than you, you take. Do you ever go to church and they give you an offering? No, they take, they take it from you. They don't give you one. Say, here, take this offering bag and pass out everybody a $20 bill. I'll tell you a secret. I thought it was the devil one time. I was uh, doing this pastor's conference. a lot of people there. But it's in our church, our local church. And a lot of people, there's probably about 100 pastors and their wives. And so uh, I was teaching the first lesson, and the Lord said, I want you to write every one of these men a check for $100. I said, what? <laughs> I said, get thee behind me, say it. Trying to steal all the money the church I got. I preached a little while longer. I said, I want you to write every one of these pastors a check. You told them they could come to this meeting, there was no obligation. And this was at the break, I went to the back. And I said, well, Lord, I didn't charge him. He said, I said there was no obligation for them, but there is for you. I said, I didn't give every one of them $100. I don't even know some of them's names. So I called Gary, out the back, and I said, Gary, go get all these guys' names, write me a check for $100. He said, oh, well, Pastor Dan, you don't know what you're saying. He said, did you know the rent is due Monday? And that was Saturday. Church was Sunday, and we had to pay the rent on Monday. And he said, ah. And I said, well, how many people's here? Not about 100, is it? How much would that be? He looked at me and he said, there's more than 100 people here. I said, well, count them. I started saying, no, don't give them a check. He said, I can give them a check, but we're not going to have the rent. We were leasing the building. It was a big building. It was a long time ago. It was a lot of money. Back then, it was $3,500 a month. That included utilities or nothing. And so a long time ago. And so I went in the back and I struggled with it. Oh my God. And the Lord said to me, Is it really more blessed to give than it is to receive? <laughs> so I said, I don't know too much about that. I want to be on the receiving end. So he did it. We did it. I said, Do it. But when I first had that thought, I'm serious now. I know it's wrong, but I thought, That's the devil. I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. It was God. So I said, okay, we're going to do it. He did it, and he said, well, you got about $300 in the bank. You need $3,000 Monday. Monday morning after church, you got to go pay it. I said, okay. And uh, we got through the meeting, and, and so Sunday at noon, after we were out, he said, come to your office, and I'm going to talk to you. I said, okay. I thought he was going to tell me we didn't get nothing. We didn't get trouble. He said, we got more than we usually get, plus we got all the lease money. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, we can pay the lease. And we have almost double what we usually get after we pay the lease. I said, I want to see that on paper. He said, well, don't forget you got Sunday night. I said, we're a pretty big church there on Sunday night we usually get. We had plenty. We didn't even miss that money. Did you know somebody came to my house a few days ago? <laughs> Called me and said, I want to stop by your house. I said, what for? I don't want to get no long conversation with preachers or anybody up. I'm studying. I said, well, God told me to come by your house. Are you there? I said, I'm here. Okay. An envelope with 10 $100 bills in it. I didn't see it, it was sealed. I just, I just put it in my pocket. You know, I'd be rude to see what I just did. <laughs> put it in my pocket. I took it in the house and laid it on my little 
bar thing next to the kitchen. I, mean, I forgot all about it. I was putting this stuff together. No, it was before that, so it wasn't this stuff, but I was putting something together. I remember working on the computer. Anyway, I finally remembered it. I went over and opened it up. I'd like to pass that. I said, well, look, you give me a $100 bill. There was nine more, but <laughs> praise the Lord. It's more blessed to give than receive. But we don't rip people off, and we don't uh, twist money out of the, the saints of God in the church and barely got enough to eat. But when they give their tithes, most people don't have anything left. And they pull and pull and beg and try to get something out of them. There's something wrong with that. Discern the motives. That's what we're talking about. Discerning the motives of people. Choose your friends carefully. Your associations will unleash. Your possibilities or stifle your dreams. Discern the motives of the people you're dealing with. Love gives at the expense of itself. The Bible said we love Him because He first loved us and He died for us. You want people to love you, you've got to love them first. When people don't love you and they're trying to manipulate you to get things from you that you wouldn't normally do and they can use a lot of persuasion. Some people are orators. They can make you cry and make you laugh. And in the meanwhile, they're, they're extracting what they need from your wallet. Let me tell you something. Nothing Jesus has is for sale. What do you owe God? Tithes, he said, and offerings. And that's it. How much is an offering? It could be a penny. Could be a dollar, could be ten million dollars if you had that much to give. What is a tithe? Ten cents on the dollar. That's it. Now listen to this one and write it down. Number four. Friendships. Friendships are based on mutual interest. Friendships are based on mutual interest. Or Mutual problems. Be sure you know the difference. Have you ever evaluated your relationship with certain people? Is it bust or is it love? Have you discerned their, <coughs> their motives? If I come to the church every day, Jesse's here every day, go up to his office and ask him money for money every day a little long, that's okay, but if I just do it all the time and I'm just always there, he, he begins to say, hey, this guy's motivation is to get all my money. <laughs> He's trying to break the church. Friendships are based on mutual interest or mutual problems. Be sure you know the difference. Are you ready for this one? Name the relationship for what it really is is. There used to be an old song that said it's not love but it's okay. If it's not love in that relationship it's not okay. Name the relationship for what it is. If you're the only one that receives anything from your relationship with another person there's something wrong with you. Love gives, lust takes. If you're the only one receiving anything out of this relationship with me, say this thing, me and him have a relationship. So if all he ever gets from my relationship is nothing, we don't have a relationship. If I just follow him around for what I can get from him, that's not a real friendship and relationship. That's lust. Did you know when you go to church, some people lust after the money in your billfold? I believe some of them, when they get it, they kiss it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this money. The love of money is not the cause of all sin. It's the root of all evil. I got to lie to you to get money out of you. I am a liar. And this relationship, say, between me and him is just... I'm taking from him, oh, I love you, Jesse, so wonderful you have me, you did this for me, oh, bless your name and all that. No, it's a two-way street. That's lust, but love, we can have a friendship based on love, and we're helping each other, and we're supporting one another, 
And you've helped me before, lots of times. I didn't ask him, but I was grateful for what he did. He did it out of love. I didn't say, now, if you'll give to me $1,000 next 90 days, God's going to get back to you 100 for return. That's a lie. And I'll tell you this, one time I gave some money, and I got more than 100 for return in a week or two. But I didn't do it to get to the return. I just gave it because God said to. Your motives have a lot to do with the way God responds to you. God knows your heart. You say, oh God, I'll do anything, Lord. I'll change, I'll give you my life, Lord. And then you don't do it. Well, God's not fair. He didn't do what I asked him to do. God don't listen to you. You have to listen to him. If God did what we told him to do, he'd be crazy. God doesn't obey me. I have to obey him. I heard a guy on television the other day said, I told God the other day, I'm through with this. Now, God, you're going to have to check. I thought, ooh, I don't even want to go around that guy. Because lightning might hit him and hit him. You get too close to him and hit you. No, he's telling God what he better do. I thought, you know what? You, you, you better get out of the ministry and save your own life if you possibly can. Name the relationship for what it really is. Friendships are based on mutual interest or problems. Be sure you know the difference. Why not have a relationship with this guy? And I'm talking about two men. Well, because I got the same desires he does. He likes football, baseball, soccer, or tennis, whatever, golf. I like it too. Oh, yeah, we're good friends. Your friendship is based on what you like mutually. But what if he don't like to go to the Dodger game with you anymore because he hates the Dodgers and he loves the Angels? You don't have anything in common anymore. What do you have in common? Baseball. You're going to build your life on baseball? Or basketball or whatever? No. Jesus had two types of friends. And we're going to close with this. Jesus had two types of friends. Number one. Those who ministered to Him such as Mary and Martha. Jesus had two types of friends. Those who ministered to him, such as Mary and Martha. Two, the other kind of friends he had was those who received his ministry to them, such as Zacchaeus up in the tree. He wasn't feeding Jesus, but he did. <laughs> he said, come to my house. But, Jesus had two types of friends, those who ministered to him and those who received his ministry to themselves. There will be many people in your life, if you're a pastor, many people will come to your ministry who cannot be your friend. But you have to love them. I've had people in our church, I wouldn't walk across the street with them because they're full of sin, doing drugs, killing people, and stealing and robbing. And but I love them just like Jesus turned to his disciples and said, you are my what? Friends? Did he say that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees? No, he said, you're of your father the devil. There's a difference. But he loved them. And when he died for them, he died for them. When he died for the word, died for them. That, that killed him. But see, we've got to discern the relationship. We've got to find out if we've got a mutual interest or a mutual problem. I, when I used to drink, I didn't hang around people who didn't drink. Because they bored me. I wanted to get drunk. Somebody said, did you just drink just for fun? I said, no, I drank to get drunk. Well, what'd you like to get drunk for? I don't know. Crazy. Then it got mean. I'm one of those guys that, you know, my uncle, the youngest uh, uh, uncle of mine, he got drunk and he became a preacher too. <laughs> but he would laugh and he'd have a lot of fun. I get drunk, I'm going to hurt you. I said, something bad wrong with me. I'm releasing something in there that I didn't know. It's in there, man, I'm going to hurt somebody. Do you have a uh, mutual interest or a mutual problem? Why are they your friends? You know, I was working with a group of men who became false prophets. 
And before I understood everything, and I thought they were nice people, well, I liked them. But I went to school and came back, and they said, we want you to go to all the churches and preach uh, New Testament theology and uh, pastoral theology. I said, okay. And then I started listening, and I found out, hey, we're not on the same page anymore. Uh, I thought, I know more than he does. I always wanted to go with it. I'm not being arrogant or, or anything. I always want to be with a guy, listen to him talk and everything, and, and preach. And then I found out, I know more than this guy does. And I think, we don't, we don't really have a mutual interest. He's got a problem. But I don't have that problem. I don't have nothing in common with him. You have a relationship with someone you don't have nothing in common with them, what are you, what are you with them for then? Discerning motives. Find out why you're with that person. What they, what they, I'm not telling you to divorce your husband or your wife. And I don't know why anybody would marry somebody who wasn't their friend. That's the biggest problem. Based on something else. Jesus had two types of friends. Those who, who ministered to him and those who received his ministry to them. There will be many people in your life as a pastor or a Christian that you have to love and pray for them, but you do not have to become their friends if it's not based on a mutual love for Christ and His Word. I'm not going to hang out with them. Now, you can do as you want to. I, I can tell you you can't do this. You can do anything you want to do, but if I was you, I'd kind of go along with God. Amos 3.3 3. There are some people I don't want to be their friend. And did you know what about the people in the world? Pastor told me that. He said, I have so many worldly friends. I said, I don't have any. He said, you don't have any? I said, no. He said, why? I said, because I don't compromise the work for them. I'm telling you the truth, folks. I am not going to tell you a lie. I am going to tell you the truth. But if I tell you the truth and it offends you, you're just offended. Go to God and deal with it. But if I offend you personally and call you something or do something bad to you, you tell me I will apologize and ask you to forgive me and I'll make it right. But I don't have to hang out with anybody that doesn't have an attitude of grace that loves God and is living in the Word. That's why I have a relationship with people. My relationship with all of you is based strictly on, on the love of God and the Word of God and we can be friends and enjoy each other's friendship and love each other. I love, I love people like they're my relatives. Matter of fact, I love a lot of Christians a lot more than I do my relatives because they're nicer. We have something in common. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? Amos 3.3, read it. You know the answer to that? No. Can two walk together unless they agree? No. You want to prove it to you? Come on, Richard. We're going to walk together. I'll let Richard be God. You're God today, Richard. So you stand and look at them. You're God. And I'm somebody trying to serve the Lord. Come on, Richard. Now, we're going to walk together. You start. You don't believe it does that? I'm not doing it. It does that. If you get five, it goes in a big circle. I can't walk two ways at once. If any two will agree. Can we walk together? But what if I do this, and this is God, and he keeps going this way, and I'm going to Quit walking with God somewhere. You relinquished your relationship with God for someone or something that benefited you or you thought it did more than God. It'll cost you your life. It'll cost you your life. This lady said to me, and I'm closing. Well, we're not married, but we're living together. But God knows us, and He loves us. I said, yeah, he loves you and he knows you're an idiot. 
If he don't love you enough to marry you, why would you be with him? The relationship is not love, it's lust. He lusts after you. You might love him, but he's lusting after you. He won't marry you. He's using you. Get it? When a preacher rips you off, he don't love you. When he... Jesus said to me, do you love my sheep? He said, yeah. He said, feed them, not fleece them, not beat them. Feed them. We can get out of love so quickly and get into lust because it suits our attitude or where we are or whatever. But you better let go of everything that keeps you from going on with God. Everything and every person. decision we make for God is a life decision. Everyone we make that's contrary to the will of God is a death decision. I haven't taught you any false doctrine today. None. I read every scripture from the Bible. I don't know everything. Neither do you. You know why? If everything Jesus did when he was in the earth was written in books, the whole world couldn't hold them. So I think we've missed a whole lot. We ain't got it all yet. But someday when we get there, then we will know it all. Right now, we don't. Nobody knows it all because it's not all written down. But there's enough right here for everything that you need. It's right here. I said he knew everything. I said, but what about all that stuff that wasn't written? If it had been, the whole world couldn't hold the books. He said, what about it? I said, well, do you know that? He said, yeah, I'll try to hear. 
I said, no, it's not ready. She said, okay. No. Some get it, some don't get it. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for those who come to the class this morning. Lord, help us to get our heads on straight, get our hearts in the right place. Let go of whatever keeps us from going on with God. Think about our relationship. Is it a mutual interest or a problem? And get our lives in a place where the blessing of the Lord can really come upon us, overtake us. Lord, thank you for these people that are hungry for your word. That's why they're here. God, use them for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Appreciate it so much.